For thousands of years, humans have known at least one incontrovertible medical fact, that an apple a day keeps the doctor away. But are we now entering an era where an apple will actually make you more likely to see the doctor? Apple made a big announcement recently that the latest iWatch has got built-in heart rhythm monitoring. This goes one step beyond the uh, heart rate trackers that we've had for a few years' time and can actually record an ECG or an EKG, depending on where in the world you are, and detect an abnormal heart rhythm. From the um, sensational press coverage, you would think that this would be saving more lives than penicillin. Is this true? I'm a practicing cardiologist, a heart doctor. I'm also a big fan of tech. And the reason I'm laying my cards on the table up front is because if I come across slightly negative in this video, it's not because I'm not a fan of the technology. In fact, I think it's very clever, but there are some considerable implications. In this video, I hope to uh, set the record straight to give you a detailed, scientific, and unbiased cardiologist's look at Apple's claims, um, its possible effects, and perhaps a glimpse into the future. Firstly, an apology. This video is a few weeks late. I did want to get it out sooner, but I was doing something very unusual for me. I was taking a holiday. Hopefully you shouldn't see any ads on this video because this is not a monetized channel. Um, and as a result, I didn't have any uh, pressing uh, reasons to make this video urgently, but I did think it was important to get made and to cut through some of the hype. Don't Thankfully, this story is going to remain topical for quite some time, particularly because the first few weeks of sales of the iWatch have exceeded even the most optimistic estimates. Five quick facts before we start. Number one, irregular heartbeat is a phrase you'll have seen in a lot of the press coverage. It's a meaningless term. Irregular heartbeat can encompass something completely innocuous, like ectopic or extra beats, which most of us will get from time to time and normally require nothing but reassurance. But irregular heartbeat can also include something called atrial fibrillation, which is a significant uh, heart condition. Sometimes automated systems can misdiagnose the innocent heart condition for the serious one. Number two, atrial fibrillation or AF is an important heart condition. It can increase your risk of having a stroke, which is a blood clot in the brain. It predominantly affects elderly people, not the young. A blood clot in the heart arteries is called a heart attack. That's something entirely different. The Apple Watch cannot predict or prevent a heart attack, and Apple have not claimed anything along those lines. Number three, certain features of the Apple Watch are FDA approved. What I think actually was more notable was the presence of the American Heart Association president, Ivor Benjamin, at the launch, who spoke very enthusiastically about the Apple Watch. And I think this is a big coup for Apple. Can you imagine if the president of the American Heart Association appeared at the launch of a new drug, which hadn't been formally tested, hadn't got any peer-reviewed uh, published data, and said it was wonderful? Number four, to diagnose AF at present, we typically use ambulatory monitoring, which is a heart monitor with a few stickers stuck on your chest, which patients will wear for anything between one to seven days on average. This uh, usually provides a three-lead ECG, meaning it looks at the electrical activity in the heart from three different angles. When you go to your doctor's clinic and have a formal ECG, this is done with 12 leads. The Apple Watch will provide a one-lead ECG. The more leads you have, the more accurate your test. And this leads me conveniently onto point number five. No test is 100% accurate. In some ways, I've already made a video about this. My latest upload, which came out a few days before the Apple News, was about medical over-testing, which is of direct relevance to the Apple Watch. So do take a look if you want a more detailed explanation. I guess you could say that I'm quite prophetic. No, no, not pathetic. Prophetic. It me just, just forget it. In a clamshell, what the video said was that every medical test has a false positive rate. And the rarer a condition you test for, the worse your ratio of false positives to true positives. Is AF a rare condition? Well, on a population basis, no. But you've got to consider who will be buying the Apple Watch. Probably somebody like me, young. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, young-ish, um, with no major medical problems, healthy, and importantly, no symptoms of ill health. What's the rate of atrial fibrillation in a young and healthy population? Well, the simple answer is we don't know. We've never tested that group of people before, but it's likely to be very low. So we can already identify the first major problem for the Apple Watch, overdiagnosis. Let's uh, do the math 
using Apple's own figures. Apple, in partnership with Stanford, have sent two trials to the FDA, and I have to say the data are not transparent, there are a lot of unanswered questions, and the data are not peer-reviewed. Neither Stanford nor Apple seem ready to publish any more information despite requests from outlets like Stat and Quartz. The larger of these trials had 588 patients, and the smaller had 226. Now, when you're studying something like atrial fibrillation, these are pretty small sample sizes. 10% of Apple Watch ECGs were uninterpretable. That's quite a lot. As a comparison, there's a company called AliveCore, who also make a device that detects atrial fibrillation, which you use in conjunction with your iPhone. Uh, they were found to have an uninterpretable ECG rate of about 4%. Out of the 90% that were readable, sensitivity was 98.3 and specificity 99.6, which sounds pretty good. But again, we have to consider the population we're studying. Positive predictive value is a measure of how likely a positive test result is to be real, to be a true positive. You want the positive predictive value to be, ideally, 100%. If grandma's knitting club all buy Apple Watches, assuming they're in their 80s, about 10% of them will have atrial fibrillation. And the positive predictive value of Apple's watch, using their own figures, will be over 90%. That's very good. However, at her granddaughter's tennis club, uh, atrial fibrillation rates with the members there may be something like one in 500, we don't know. And then the positive predictive value of the Apple Watch falls way below 50%, which is rubbish. A friend and fellow cardiologist who's based in the US and is a lot smarter than me took a deep dive into the stats from the aforementioned two trials that Apple and the FDA published. And he concluded on the limited data available to him that for every 20 positive results from the Apple Watch, only one patient will have atrial fibrillation. So that means that 19 out of 20 patients will be worried for absolutely no reason. The second major problem with the Apple Watch is we don't know what to do with the data. I don't mean that in a philosophical way. I mean, we literally don't know how to interpret this data. Let's uh, take an example. Pommy is a 38-year-old man. He has no medical problems. He works in an office. And since his slightly messy breakup, he's got really into mixed martial arts which brings him lots of joy. And he comes in to see me in clinic with his Apple Watch results. His watch has detected 30 seconds of atrial fibrillation on one occasion. What do I do? Well, there are a few possible outcomes, and as far as I'm concerned, they're all less than satisfactory. Let's go through them. Option one, I treat his atrial fibrillation. Now, treatment for AF isn't completely harmless. How do you reduce the chance of someone having a blood clot? Well, you give them an anti-clotting agent. I was uh, in the rainforests of Borneo last week and I found this, a leech. Leeches synthesize a compound called hiridin, which is a direct thrombin antagonist, the exact same group of drugs as one of the most commonly given medications for AF. Anticoagulants like this make you bleed much more than normal. Now, I realized my holiday wasn't really relevant there at all, was it? Um, it seemed like a good link, but um, I think it just sounds like I'm trying to show off about my holiday. Uh, which I was, but it's my channel, so tough luck. So I put Pommy on anti-clotting medication. And now I have to tell him that that may impact on mixed martial arts, the one thing that makes him happy, along with queuing outside the Apple store. Worst case scenario, and all jokes aside here, Pommy may fall off his bike, have a major, maybe even life-threatening bleed. Will an Apple Watch ECG stand up in court in a medical malpractice case as evidence? Option two, I decide not to treat his AF. I reassure him and I explain to Pommy that we just don't know what the minimum amount of time one needs to be in AF is to be at risk of having a stroke. If you're permanently in AF, then of course it's easy, but I show Pommy this. This is the typical pattern of atrial fibrillation. As you see, it's natural to go in and out of it for years, for longer and longer periods before it becomes permanent. So is 30 seconds of atrial fibrillation enough to put your risk of having a stroke up? Nobody knows the answer to that. What we do know is that a young, healthy, fit man like Pommy is the kind of person who will derive the least benefit from treatment for atrial fibrillation in comparison to, say, a 78-year-old man who has diabetes, high blood pressure, risk factors for stroke, and atrial fibrillation. If I start that patient on anticoagulation, I can make a big difference to his risk profile of having a stroke. Pommy, I'm not so sure. So, Pommy agrees to having no treatment. He goes home. But then, this starts playing on his mind. 
He starts worrying about the AF that was recorded. He visits some online forums. He reads things that really worry him. Surely this is a ticking time bomb. He starts monitoring his watch all day long. He develops a fixation on his heart rhythm and his anxiety shoots through the roof. This isn't making fun of Pommy. This is a perfectly understandable reaction to being diagnosed with what is a serious medical condition. Option three is a halfway house. I don't start treatment but I refer him for some tests, and I think this may be the option a lot of doctors would go for. Pommy has a CT scan. It's a small dose of radiation, but it's no big deal. However, it shows something ambiguous, so he's referred for an MRI scan. This involves injecting some drugs which make him feel absolutely dreadful, but he's okay, although it shows something slightly ambiguous again. So then he ends up having a coronary angiogram, which is an invasive test there's something like a one in 2,000 chance of dying from a coronary angiogram. Is this an acceptable risk? Does he even need this test? The coronary angiogram causes a dissection of his coronary artery. It's a rare but recognized complication of the procedure. He has a minor heart attack as a result. He's okay, but he stays in hospital for several days and undergoes lots of scans. He lives in the UK, so he doesn't have to pay, but if he was in another country, he may be less lucky. Pommy has now gone from being a healthy, regular guy to being a patient. Even if he didn't have those invasive tests, he may stay under follow-up in clinic. He may have appointments every few months, scans. He'll have to declare atrial fibrillation on medical insurance forms. I've got a big problem with medicalizing everyday life. Patients are all people, but most people are not patients and they don't need to be. I'd rather just let Pommy live his life. It may seem like common sense to monitor heart rhythm. Why would you not want to find out about atrial fibrillation? Well, as I hope I've shown, it's really not that straightforward. And one point that's very important and worth emphasizing is that in the entire collection range of medical literature published to date, we have no evidence that monitoring asymptomatic patients for atrial fibrillation actually translates into clinical benefit. Let me explain what that means. In all the trials, that have studied people to look for silent atrial fibrillation, i.e. they have no symptoms, so they've placed monitors on these patients and they've worn them for weeks or months, they have obviously diagnosed much more atrial fibrillation, but they didn't translate into any reduction in stroke or any reduction in death. So when people say the Apple Watch is gonna save lives, to me, that's hyperbole. Let me balance things out by highlighting some positives. This is a public health experiment, the scale of which we have never seen before. The information that we could glean from this could completely change the way we think about all kinds of heart disease. Some of those unanswered questions I was mentioning before, the rate of atrial fibrillation in young patients, we may be able to find that out. Do we have the capability to deal with all this information? Simple answer, no, not yet, but we're living in the era of big data and I believe more data are always useful. It's just we need to know how to interpret it. I know doctors joke about uh, being inundated with patients who have been worried by their watch, but if uh, this allows an opportunity to reassure a patient and for them to become more engaged in their health, then surely that can only be a good thing. There are several people whose work and writing in this field have been uh, very useful to me, and I'd like to thank them, John Mandrola, Venkmurthy, and Julian Holcox, um, all of whom are high-profile scientists and crucially uh, practicing cardiologists. There were also uh, many great articles from journalists too, and one by Joy Victory stood out. For more from them, the links are all below. So the big question, am I going to get an Apple Watch? Well, I've got a major declaration here is uh, I'm Android. I left iPhones years ago and uh, never look back because I prefer Samsung. But I have to admit, I'm really tempted to get an iWatch and an iPhone now. Do I think it's gonna save my life? Absolutely not. Do I think it's as cool as hell? Damn right I do. Should you get an Apple Watch? Well, ultimately that's up to you to decide, at least until Apple start paying me, in which case I'd be very happy to endorse their products. Uh, Tim, contact details are below. What I can say is that if you want to get an Apple Watch and you want to maximize its chance of having a health benefit, don't buy it for yourself. Buy it as a Christmas present this year for your favorite grandparent. Shall I, uh, shall I wear a telescope? Well, so they know that I'm a, I'm a doctor. This telescope is complete garbage. It's like it came out of a Christmas cracker. It's fairly really appropriate, I guess.